OK, can I start with an apology? I'm here in the plant breeding segment of the proceedings. Uh, I have to admit to not really being a plant breeder. All right. Uh, your this one? Yeah, yeah. The, the right hand arrow. Okay. I'm not a plant breeder. I've never been a plant breeder. I'm here in this segment because of a rumour that I worked for the Forestry Commission for 15 years. Well, that is true. I was with the Forestry Commission for 15 years, but I was never really a tree breeder or a plant breeder. What I really am is a statistician who has worked with tree breeders and has worked with animal breeders, so I have had many influences, and um, we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> I, I, people have been pointing out when they first met Robin. Uh, I believe I first met Robin in 1970. Robin probably won't remember this, but in 1970, I was doing an MSc in London, and I got notice of a job in Edinburgh in the statistics department. And uh, during the Easter vacation, I came up to Edinburgh for an informal interview in the statistics department by Richard Cormack. Richard Cormack interviewed me for the job, and uh, at the end of the interview, I had no indications of whether I was likely to get the job or not. But he did say, would you like to meet some members of the department? And at that time, the, department, the head of the department was Professor Finney. He was head of the statistics department, and he also was head of the Agricultural Research Council's unit of statistics. So I was shown around um, and met various members of both the Department of Statistics and the Agricultural Research Council unit of statistics. And I don't remember any of them now, except Robin. I do remember meeting Robin in his office, Robin sitting behind a very untidy desk. And when I went in, there he was, obviously deep in thought. And now I like to think that at that time in 1970, what he was thinking about, the idea that was gestating in his mind was Remel. That's what I like to think. On the other hand, he might have been just wondering what he might be having for his lunch that day. You can never tell. You can tell when Robin's thinking deeply, but you can not always tell what he's thinking deeply about. So that was when I first met Robin. And oh, the other thing people have been saying a lot is that Robin has been a mentor to them during their career. Well, I don't know if I could go that far as to say that Robin has been a mentor to me, but I can say that at various points in my career, he's bullied me into doing the right thing. <laughs> and that is maybe, and that maybe amounts to the same thing. He's maybe been a mentor. Okay. Right, so what I am going to talk about is various things. So there's going to be no theme. Don't look for a theme in this talk. There is no theme. I'm going to look at about three different things. And the first thing I'm going to look at is basically my experience in trying to get A.S. Remel which we all know about from a previous talk, getting A.S. Remel to do things it was never designed to do in the first place. Mostly unsuccessfully, but uh, with one, one success of a sort. And that accounts for the first two things there. The third thing is a bit of a curiosity. So we'll come to that. All right. Here's a little bit of um, A.S. Remel R. And my apologies, apologies for, I mean, I realise quite a lot of the audience will switch off immediately at this point. Uh, but this is a, yes, Remo, a bit of, this is a bit of R code incorporating 
a bit of ES for MOR. And what it's trying to do is use the reduced animal model, which was mentioned in the previous talk, the reduced animal model, which is basically something that's very useful if you have a large pedigree, but there's lots of, well, half sib or full sib families, and so there's lots of progeny there who themselves do not have progeny. And in that situation, the reduced animal model drastically reduces the computational burden of your analysis. So the little bit in blue is based on an unpublished document by Arthur Gilmore in 2004, which explained how you can use ASREML to calculate blops using the reduced animal model. And it's a very neat way of doing it, but it only calculates blups, and it explains at the end that uh, you cannot estimate variance components by this method because it involves a vector of weights which depend on the gamma parameter, the ratio of variance components, and there's no way that ASREML can be made aware that these weights are not just constant weights but actually depend on the parameter. So this is my attempt to get around that problem. So I enclose Arthur's code in a little loop. And I go around the loop. And effectively what's happening there is that the role of ASREML is reduced to calculating a log likelihood for a series of fixed values of the gamma parameter. And after you've been around the loop, you've got a set of values which you can plot against the chosen values of gamma, and you've got a profile likelihood for the gamma parameter. And if you're interested in heritability, the heritability is just some simple function of that gamma parameter. So there we are. We can actually um, estimate the heritability using the reduced animal model with this kind of extension to what ASREML already does. And our users in the audience will look at this and say to yourselves, uh, but that's not really how R is used. You know, R is a functional programming language. Uh, you tend to work with functions, not for loops. So what a real R programmer would do, as shown on the next slide, you would make up a function called log L and you'd put Arthur's code as part of the body of that function. And the purpose of that function would be to calculate the log likelihood for a fixed value of gamma. And then you could just bung it into an optimizer like that. Now that does not work. And that, uh, why that does not work is a very interesting question to which I, for which I do not have the time today to discuss. Or to put it another way, I haven't the faintest idea why this does not work. <laughs> but I, I suspect it's not simple. It's probably some very complicated, deep programming reason there why that does not work. If anybody knows why it doesn't work, don't embarrass me by shouting out the answer <laughs> now. You know, keep it and tell me later. Okay, so that's what that was. That's the success. Okay, that's the one and only success I have to show you. The rest is, you know, dismal, dismal failures. So the next thing I want to talk about is splines. And for those of you who don't know what splines are, there's a picture of. Uh, three different kinds of splines fitted to the same set of data. The data is the little round circles. And one, uh, one spline is a linear spline, one's a quadratic and one's a cubic. So at one time I was only aware of really cubic splines. Then Karen Mayer, am I allowed to mention Karen Mayer? I don't want to upset anybody. Uh, it was Karen Mayer, I wrote a paper where she investigated uh, linear, quadratic, and cubic splines um, as a way of uh, modeling growth curves 
than beef cattle. Um, so, looking at that picture, it's very easy to see which is the linear spline. It's the sort of bent stick. Yeah. The quadratic and cubic are rather similar and difficult to tell apart. But basically, our spline is just a series of polynomial segments constrained to be continuous and to have continuous derivatives at the knots. And the knot is where you move from one segment to another. I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Which button do I press to get back to where I was? Yeah, just that's it. That's it. That's good. Yeah, yeah, fine. So easy to press the wrong button. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about smoothing splines in a minute. But if we just take a look at this, these splines are all smoothing splines. They're not interpolating splines. So they're not intended to go exactly through each data point. They're smoothed. So we have a compromise between fidelity to the data on one hand and what's usually called the smoothness of the spline. So even the linear spline, which you would think would just join up the dots, doesn't just join up the dots. It's been smoothed. And you end up with this compromise between something that does re fairly well in getting close to the data points, and at the same time, it doesn't change in slope too much as you go past each knot. And similar considerations apply to quadratic and cubic splines, except they are more complicated. OK, so that's splines. Yes, here we are. Just. Uh, what I already said, you can think of the smoothing process as the effect of adding a penalty term to the residual sum of squares. So instead of setting out to minimize the residual sum of squares, you minimize the sum of squares plus some multiple of this penalty term. And what the penalty term does is penalize too rapid changes in either the slope of the line in the case of the linear spline or in the case of the quadratic or the cubic spline, it's the second derivatives at the knots. You try and keep these as small as possible. So if you these two tendencies pulling apart and you come up with some compromise between the two and what you end up with is a smoothing spline. And one way to do this is to fit these gamma parameters. Now, the gamma parameters are things you want to be small. So it's second derivatives or changes in slope. Fit these parameters as random effects in the mixed model. All right. So that was pointed out by uh, Ari Verbilla et al., Brian Cullis, and others in a paper in, I think, 1999. And the omega matrix there, which you could call the smoothing matrix, I suppose, corresponds to the inverse of the G matrix. Now, AS Remo will allow you to fit splines. And it uses a particular basis function, set of basis functions, which fit the spline as the sum of a line, a linear trend, plus a deviation from the linear train. And characteristic of this smoothing process is that an intercept and a slope go through unchanged. They are not smoothed ever. So it's the deviations from the line that get smoothed. And that works very well in the SRMO. The downside of doing it that way is that you end up with covariance matrices for the intercept and the slope and the deviations. And you look at that covariance matrix that you've estimated, and you can't tell intuitively whether it's making sense or not. It would be much better to have a covariance matrix which is 
much closely, much more closely related to the scale of the, or the, yeah, the scale of the y variable. And there is a way of doing that, and it's called, um, well, the basis for it is called the B-spline basis, and there are others like it. And when you use the B-spline basis, either exactly in the case of the linear spline or approximately in the case of the other ones, the parameters you estimate, the regression coefficients that you estimate, have this property that they are basically the values of the spline, the ordinates of the spline at the not positions. And that's a much more uh, helpful thing to have if you're going to estimate covariance matrices, because then you can look at the covariance matrix and you can expect a certain pattern there. And if you don't see that pattern, you know you've got things somewhat wrong. Now, I don't think you can do this in ES Remel. I may be wrong. And the reason I think you can't do this is that the G inverse matrix you, you, you use for the B-spline basis is singular. Now, there was some mention of singular G matrices in the last talk. So maybe we can look forward to a time when the SRML will deal with singular G inverse matrices. But at the moment, it seems to me it doesn't. Although it will take special measures to deal with a singular G matrix. But it doesn't seem to want to deal with a singular <coughs> G inverse. So that's, that's the failure. But I, I would like to mess around with B spline splines in AS Remel, and AS Remel won't let me because I think AS Remel is not happy with uh, singular G inverses. In that formula, which is from the AS Remel manual, the bit nobody ever reads, called a bit of theory. Uh, log determinant of G could be replaced by minus log determinant of G inverse. But if G inverse is singular, you get that term is no use. Okay. Five minutes. Good. So that takes me on to... Oh, there's a picture. I haven't got time to talk about that picture. But it's really only there because I wanted to establish some kind of credentials as a plant breeder. And I was going to talk about a tree experiment. Unfortunately, there's no time. So that takes me straight on to this rather this curiosity. Uh, is the final thing I want you to talk about. <coughs> We're all used to Remel. We know what Remel is. A residual likelihood. Estimation based on a residual likelihood. And it's specifically tailored to dealing with normally distributed data and the parameters being estimated are usually variance components and covariances. And I thought, well, you know, is there anything out there that deals with non-normal data or a situation where the parameter being estimated is not a variance component? So I found a paper in, I've forgotten what year it was. <laughs> It'll be on a slide that comes up later. I found a paper that seemed to do something rather like this. And this is the data that um, was used as an exercise in using this method. And it's uh, <coughs> data that you might think is binomial, but it's actually, you look at it more closely, it's obviously not straightforwardly binomial. It's highly over-dispersed. You can't explain that data as a set of binomial observations with a constant probability throughout. The probability varies from strain to strain of mouse. Uh, Bill Hill should recognize this data. It's, uh, it was it featured in the very first Biometrics Consultants Forum in 1977, I think, and you commented on this data. Now, what, what the, this paper did is used something called the beta binomial distribution to model this data. And the beta binomial distribution arises when you have binomial data, but the probability is not constant. It varies from occasion to occasion in a beta distribution, 
the parameters a and b. And you, a marginal distribution, when you integrate out the beta, you get this kind of thing here. So if I've got a binomial, or an apparently binomial, n trials are successes, I get a term something like this, contributing to the likelihood for the beta binomial distribution. But it's a horrible, horrible thing. It's very difficult to deal with. But anyway, um, the parameters we're interested in are probably not A and B. They're more likely to be tau, which is an interclass correlation coefficient, and pi, which is an average probability over all streams. And what we have here is a Remel type likelihood, which is based on an approximate conditional argument. So uh, it was argued that most of the information about pi is going to come from the total number of, if I just briefly go back to that slide, 179 is the total number of mouse, mice without tumors. And that statistic will capture almost all the observation about pi. And the conditional distribution of the data, given that statistic, will capture almost all the information about tall. I think that's what you call a heuristic argument. Well, that's a lack of precision about the argument, but still could be, could be compelling. Anyway, this likelihood, solid line, is based on that conditional distribution. It's not a trivial distribution to work out, but that's what it's based on. And I have compared it, the dotted line, with um, what you get from a more conventional approach. And I was rather surprised to see the extent to which these two likelihoods differ. I rather expected to find that the location of the likelihood estimate of the interclash correlation was much the same, and I wouldn't have been surprised to see a difference in dispersion. But actually, what you see there is you've got both. But the likelihood's changed. Now, and not by very much. I seem to remember the original estimate was 0.27, and it's now, according to this version of the likelihood, 0.32 or so. But uh, I was surprised to what extent the thing changed. And possibly, possibly, if we regard this as a Remel type uh, likelihood, that that shift in the likelihood's position corresponds to the sort of bias that's removed when we estimate variance components um, by Remel rather than maximum likelihood. But that's just speculation. That's just speculation. Okay, that's it. That's all I have to say.